In these videos, we're going to talk about cyber physical systems and critical infrastructure. So by the end, you should be able to understand what these are and in particular how cyber physical systems relate to critical infrastructure. You should understand the cybersecurity challenges of cyber physical systems and examine the risks and mitigations in healthcare, IoT and in cars. Critical infrastructure is defined as those physical facilities, supply chains, information technologies and communication networks which, if destroyed, degraded or rendered unavailable for an extended period, would significantly impact the social or economic well-being of the nation or affect Australia's ability to conduct national defence and ensure national security. So that's as defined by the Australian government, but of course all governments uh, have their own view on critical infrastructure. So examples of this include water, electricity and gas supply, telecommunications, public health, agriculture, financial services, transportation and shipping. There are plans underway at the moment to extend the definition of critical infrastructure to include uh, the universities. Operational technology refers to systems that are used to manage industrial operations. Industrial control systems are the systems that are used to manage, monitor and control systems in industry. They are usually of two types. Continuous process control systems managed by programmable logic controllers, PLCs, and discrete process control systems that may use PLCs but also use batch process control devices. Industrial control systems, or ICS, are often managed by super, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition, or SCADA. Um, so the, these are the important terms that we come across when looking at uh, industrial control systems. So SCADA in particular operates on a different layers, uh, starting with the field level, level zero, where the sensors and control valves uh, operate. Controlling those are input-output modules and distributed electronic processes, um, then followed by supervisory computers collecting data, followed by production control level, uh, which are coordinating computers, and then production scheduling, so the computer center. So when looking at these systems and looking at the security, there are all these different uh, elements to it that need to be considered. Some of the security weaknesses that are particularly associated with SCADA include the fact that when SCADA was first developed, they weren't built with security in mind. They weren't designed um, with security principles. Uh, they were thought to be secure because they were isolated and not internet connected and of course that has changed uh, over the past decade. Uh, so they don't use any encryption and that was partly also to save on processing power and potentially cost. They rely on security through obscurity, proprietary systems, and there was a belief that people wouldn't necessarily be able to attack them if they didn't understand those systems. But of course, people are able to reverse engineer a lot of these uh, firmware and software that runs these systems. The other problem is that updates to SCADA are not cryptographically secure, and so that represents another potential weakness. So considering these uh, weaknesses, in 2015, a cyber attack on the Ukrainian power grid shut power to 230,000 consumers for one to six hours. The attack was started through spear phishing with some malware that was associated with the emails called Black Energy 3. The phishing email opened a Word document that prompted the user to enable macros and then installed the malware. This gave the attackers a backdoor. From the corporate network, the attackers got onto the network with the SCADA devices. They disabled the uninterruptible uh, power supplies, the UPS, flooded the call center with a denial of service so that it would be very hard for them to uh, be contacted. 
through the breaker switches for the power substations and then rewrote the firmware for communications hardware in the substations, again making it difficult to remediate. They then wiped the operator's terminals using malware called KillDisk, um, again make it difficult to recover. The Ukrainians blamed Russia for the attack uh, as it came during the conflict between the two nations, but no evidence was presented. The attack happened immediately following kinetic attacks, uh, which are physical attacks on substations providing power to Crimea and a Russian naval base. The subsequent attack was seen as retribution uh, by Russia for these attacks. However, the preparation would have taken at least six months, and so it's likely that the original motivation for hacking the power companies was for other reasons. Much more damage could have been done, including causing the power stations to explode. And in these situations, there may be an element of any number of governments or even criminal groups simply displaying their capabilities. Another case study was a uh, malware called Stuxnet, which was discovered in 2010. But it was launched in 2005 against specific SCADA controllers that were responsible for operating centrifuges or monitoring centrifuges in our uranium enrichment facilities in Iran. The initial target is Windows networks. And then once they've got onto those networks, they specifically target the PLC running stuff, software from the, the German company Siemens called Siemens Step 7 software. The malware caused the centrifuge to spin at dangerously high speeds, eventually causing damage and inoperability. The malware also masked activity by reporting a normal operating environment. And the malware got onto the Windows network in the first place through infecting the laptops of engineers through phishing um, and then uh, was transported from there uh, to the air-gapped uh, Windows networks through the use of USBs. So Stuxnet infects computers via USB memory sticks and so can cross air gaps, but then uses a variety of other techniques to travel across networks. The malware only operates if it finds Siemens software and was coded initially to only target specific networks. However, a programming error meant it spread and was found infecting machines all around the world on the internet and that's how it came to light. It involves a large number of zero days, and this is unusual in malware. Uh, related malware to Stuxnet is our malware called Dooku and Flame, um, which have similar effects. It's been suggested that the attack was part of a joint US-Israel operation called Operation Olympic Games that was launched by US President Obama. Significant code similarities with code released by the Shadow Brokers in 2017, which purported to include an exploit development framework, was developed by the Equation Group, a cybersecurity development team at the NSA uh, in America. It is also thought that only a nation state actor could have invested the time and resources in mounting this attack. And a more recent attack cutting power to Iranian nuclear power facilities may have been another attack, targeted attack by a nation state. Again, stress that these are only theories about attribution. Uh, nothing has ever been definitively proven in this regard. And so all we can do is conjecture. Cyber physical systems, or CPS, are the combinations of sensors, communications, process control, and systems to interface with and control the physical environment. They're related to technologies like IoT, Internet of Things, smart cities, and in fact, smart anything. Examples of cyber physical systems include industrial control systems, ICS, smart grids for controlling power, autonomous vehicles, robots, healthcare systems, um, and other things. Communication is via a number of different protocols, but will increasingly rely on 5G plus technologies and involve machine to machine communication or M to M. Some of the characteristics of cyber physical systems include the fact that they utilize embedded systems. 
it doesn't need general purpose computing and a full operating system. So often it's just firmware that is uh, embedded in a chip. These systems are often real-time systems uh, responding in uh, fixed lengths of time, which are often very short. They have a raft of protocols that, for networking, and they're not particularly secure. They're only just moving now to IP-based protocols, and so you will see that there are proprietary systems uh, used within cyber-physical systems. Power and power supply is a significant issue in CPS. So this gives you an overall diagram of the arrangement of cyber-physical systems that involves sensors uh, that are measuring from physical system, actuators that are operating on that to do things like open valves, open doors, etc. They're communicating via a network to distributed controllers of some sort. The challenges that face CPS cybersecurity are that the attacks may result in physical harm and even death, and this is what makes them particularly serious. It's difficult to switch off devices or parts of the network if your uh, operational systems depend on those uh, functionality uh, continuing. For example, supplying power, running a nuclear facility, um, that sort of thing. Uh, default administrative ports are often left open with insecure protocols such as Telnet, FTP, TFTP and HTTP. They haven't moved yet to secure protocols. Default manufacturer passwords used for administrative functions. There is limited memory and processing, which has limited the implementation of security. The other aspect is that assets in this realm last something between 15 and 20 years, and so it makes it very difficult to update and change. The environmental threats to both the systems themselves and then the systems threats to the environment Updating firmware in this environment is open to exploitation. There is no code signing or checking done on a lot of the firmware that updates these systems. Uh, communication is unencrypted. It's subject to injection attacks through malicious commands and also vulnerable to all other types of attacks, malware, sniffing, spoofing, denial of service, etc. Physical access to devices is hard to control. If you've got for example, valves on a pipeline, and that pipeline is remote regions. It's difficult for even the operators themselves to visit and update, uh, let alone control against damage from um, malevolent parties or even from things like animals and the weather. One of the main challenges, as I mentioned, of CPS is updating firmware, especially when this is done over the air. You can use code signing to ensure the firmware update has not been tampered with and is from a trusted source. The device would ho hold a public key for the update service and individual files within the firmware update can be signed as well. What you need in this case is a cryptographic bootloader to handle the loading and checking of firmware. In terms of mitigation, traditional protections through firewalls, intrusion detection protection systems, segregation of network and access control, especially remote access is one approach. Closing default administration point ports and changing default passwords is part of the hardening process and updating firmware through regular updates. Of course, if controllers don't need to be connected to the internet, then actually that is one way of uh, uh, also uh, implementing a mitigation strategy.